Um, today we're going to be looking at language, reading, and dyslexia, which are massive subjects, and it's kind of ridiculous to be um, trying to cover it all in, in the time that we've, we've got but uh, I will do my best. We will still have our teaching and learning notes uh, that I try to do every week. Um, we're gonna be having some regular breaks. We're gonna be doing a bit of space learning today, which is uh, an interesting issue. Um, but I'm also gonna be asking you what you know about language terms, and that's coming up um, very, very soon. We'll be looking at spoken language, then written language, um, atypical language, and what might be the cause of, of dyslexia. Okay, so these terms, I was sort of looking through this and I suddenly realized that, that actually you might not know some of these terms. And the trouble is that once you start talking about language research and you start bandying these terms around, it's very easy to get lost unless you're completely familiar with what they mean. So, um, and it's also helpful for me really just to ask you what you understand about these things. I mean, for example, can somebody tell me what a phoneme is? I'm kind of interested to know if you know this. If I, if I just sort of... Can I just pick somebody randomly, actually? Can I pick you? Do you know what a phoneme is? No. Okay. Um, do, you, do you know what a phoneme is? The pronunciation. The pronunciation, yes, you're right. This is getting towards, it's actually, yeah, that's quite close. That lady there is having a smile. Yeah, have you got any idea? The sound, okay, yes. Yeah. So it is something, to, it's basically, um, it's a unit of sound that comprises the sound of, of a word. Um, and there's a lot of argument, actually, about what a phoneme is. I used to work in the phonetics department, although I'm not a phonetician, but it always used to amuse me. Um, but I worked in the phonetics department, but nobody could tell me what a phoneme was. <laughs> so it's still... But, but essentially, the idea is that you can break up the sound of a word into dis discrete chunks. So, um, you know, helicopter might be h, e, l, i, k. To, uh, or something like that. Um, what about uh, what about orthography? What about grapheme? Actually, that might be. Anyone know what a grapheme is? Yeah. Well, I think grapheme is a, a writing symbol that is connected with a phoneme. It's a, it's a, a writing symbol of the phoneme. Let's say if uh, after yeah. the word was good, it's a phoneme. The letter V is the grapheme of phoneme. Good. Yeah, okay, that's good. So it's the sort of written equivalent of the phony. Orthography, can somebody tell me what orthography is? Maybe Jed knows what orthography is. I've got... So you've asked too many questions, Jed. I know your name now. <laughs> <laughs> so it's what happens. <laughs> Even when you don't want to ask me a question, I can still ask you a question. Uh, orthography, any idea? I forgot. No, okay. Anyone? Okay, I'll take a volunteer. Patricia. Apparently it comes from the Greek. Oh, the blimming Greeks know all these. They've got it sorted because all these words come from Greek. Oh, yeah, it's true. Okay. Uh, no, it's not your fault. The right way. The right way. I like that because the right way is actually about rules of, of spelling. It's, uh, yeah, so it's not necessarily, well, I suppose it is kind of like a dictionary, but also, you know, if there's a I before E except after C, that's orthography. So when you start having these conventions, um, logographic. Anyone? The, I find this a little bit difficult because, in a way, because it's kind of different from from the other ones, but similar. No, no, no. Just, just, just go like that if you haven't got a clue. No, 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 no. Oh, oh, but not Greek, Maria. <laughs> it's a kind of system. Uh, for example, Chinese language is. Writing. Yeah, so it's kind of like the writing system. That's 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 not bad. Yeah. So they're looking at the pattern of the the word. So it's word patterns. Um, what about lexicon? I'm going to ask somebody I haven't asked for Francis. Speech. Uh, could be, but not necessarily. Could actually be other types. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure how I'm going to describe this actually, because I've got the answers that I haven't <laughs> on the next slide. But lexicon, it could be, it could be a list of speech sounds, but it could also be uh, other types of this. So it could be um, 
an orthographic. Have we done that one yet? It could be an orthographic lexicon, which tells you um, a list of spellings. Okay, so it, or it could even be, I imagine, a phonemic, a phonemic lexicon, which could be a list of sounds. A acoustic, acoustic, acoustic. Yeah, it's just sound basically, and that's important because we might be analysing things acoustically, but we but that doesn't necessarily mean it's what people hear. So we're actually looking at what's in the air, if you like, in terms of its frequency and its timing information. Articulatory. See, that's what that's what first alerted me to this when I saw the word articulatory in my slides. I thought, actually, I don't even know whether you know what I'm talking about if I use the word articulatory. What about that lady there? Yes, you, madam. Yes. <laughs> Any ideas? Yeah, which means? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, mm, uh, sort, sort of. I think we have to constrain, but, but it could be, yes. Yes. So it's actually the, spe the, spoke the speaking of the word. The speaking of the words, what I'm doing now. But it's interesting you said that about expressing because I don't think it's used scientifically in a written form. It's always about the, spe the speaking form. This is the trouble because sometimes these words can be used in the in a common way, one sense, and then in a scientific way, in another sense. Francis, um, it, it refers to the vocal. Yeah. Sounds. So it has to be vocal sounds. Yes. Yeah. Mechanics as well. So it's how you form your mouth. Yes, so it's all the, the motor responses that are required, um, the shape of the tongue and the way in which you use the tongue, all the things that you do in order to make the sound. Yeah. Um, auditory. Auditory? Hearing, okay, that's good. Uh, motor, see that's not those words that I keep moving around and I wonder, well, actually if I keep saying motor, are you going to understand what I mean? Do you know what I mean by motor? Sorry? No, that's interesting you don't know, actually. Motor? Are you searching it? Well, that's not the same as knowing it, just because it's on Google. <laughs> that's fair enough. Any idea, motor? People are getting nervous now. I can see that moving around. Motor? Yes, movement, yeah. Did you say that as well? Yeah, sorry. Okay, movement. Movement, yeah, that's all it means. But it's one of those things that, that scientists use a lot, and, and then you... You know, and, and if, but, but you have to realise that it's 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 kind of annoying. Why don't, I don't know why people don't just say movement. Um, Broca's area and Wernicke's area. Ha, I, I'm just interested. Put your hand up if you've heard of one or either of Broca, Broca's area or Wernicke's area. Oh, that's, that's very interesting. Put your hand up if you haven't. Oh, okay, well that is interesting. Okay, so we've got the we've got the basics. Um, in fact, I've made the adjustment to this to this these slides. This would have just gone up probably last night, sorry. I just had the idea on Sunday morning that I should put this at the beginning. It, <laughs> I'm always doing that, but then it would be better to do it than not to do it. So I've just put a little dictionary there of things, um, which you can refer back to if you get, if you get lost um, when you're doing your research on language, um, if you do that. Okay. And you can see the phoneme there. I do love those symbols, those special phonetic symbols we use to represent these segments of sound, which we like to think makes up words. So the brain basis of spoken language. Um, there's a lot of discussion about whether language is innate or not. I think there's all sorts of things about the primate brain which make it very suitable for acquiring language when we have enough neurons. However, um, a, a lot of the apparatus you need to produce language physiologically um, and in terms of um, neural function are present in, in other primates to a lesser extent, but still there. So, you know, we're sort of quantitatively different, but not qualitatively different. We are very strongly social and we have a great inclination towards social learning, looking at me, looking at you. There was an example of that, I was in the shopping centre at the weekend and there was a massive queue in Broadmead 
And I just, ha I mean, I, I found it really difficult to walk past it without wanting to know what they were queuing for. And I, and I, I wasn't allowed to find out, but I was analysing all the people, thinking the demographics, we're about 20 to 30, they're looking a bit trendy, they're probably, you know, it's probably tickets for something. <laughs> so you can't help attending to other people and being interested in what other people are interested in. And, and those sorts of instincts make us focus on social interactions. But, you know, uh, a lot of the uh, skills, a lot of the basic primary functions we use for language, we, we use for other things as well, like motor coordination. However, um, one, you know, there is a sense in which there is a, some level of innateness, at least, or not, I, no, I have to be careful about the word innate, but some level of preparedness for language, because after a certain age, it becomes quite difficult to differentiate between different phonemes, I can use that word now, phonemes, if you haven't heard them. And I'm talking about sort of three months. So, because I'd never heard Russian when I was a baby, um, when I started trying to learn Russian at around about 30, I had a lot of difficulties. And my main difficulty was not being able to hear the difference in certain sounds. I'm a bit nervous now because I've only got a couple of Russians in the audience, but I'm, there's this T sound that like it, it's um, a T or a T, 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 is that right? Something like that. It's where you put the tongue on the roof of the mouth. And my Russian teacher, we used to, we used to sit there for hours with her saying, ta, 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 ta. It's kind of, no, no, it's, just, it's completely the same. There is no difference between these sounds. And it took me a very long time to hear it because I'd gone past my sensitive window. Actually, I'd gone past it many, many years ago when I was uh, <laughs> under the age of one. So we do have sensitive periods in terms of language development. Um, but they're sensitive, not critical. That means it is possible, but more difficult to learn after you've passed that point. Um, babies come into the world, however, able to distinguish between all speech sounds. And we have evidence of that, but you lose that ability by around about six months, unless you've been actually rehearsing it, unless you've been hearing it, not rehearsing it, hearing it. So now you can get these machines where you press different things and they play different phonemes so as to make you more prepared for a multilingual society. It's quite a good idea, really. The only problem with it is that it doesn't seem to work because it's not based on human interaction. Isn't that interesting? We are so socially orientated towards each other that machines are just not good enough. Um, hearing it on a video or having it from a toy is not the same as having people around you who you identify with and who your, your attention is drawn towards using those sounds. That is much, that is the thing, not, not hearing them, but hearing people use them because you are so interested, even as a, as a baby, you, you pick that up. So we have known for a long time that language appears to be, a, lo a large amount of it is handled by the left hemisphere, but there are right hemisphere regions that get involved as well. And there are two particular regions that came to the attention of neuroscientists very early on in the 19th century. One of them was Broca's area. And Paul Broca noticed that when people had damage to this region of the brain here, uh, they had, they, they, were, they, um, they just had trouble articulating the words, essentially. So it wasn't that it was meaningless. You, you could tell that they knew what the word should be, but they could not articulate it. And that is, hello? Hello? Yeah, I have a question, because you mentioned that in the ladies, the new book, that they were uh, activated broadcast area, but then if you're listening to it, should you be in the broadcast area? Uh, when did I say that? <laughs> like, that <laughs> I said that it activated it in babies. Um, yeah, it do, well, it does. I think it, I thought it activated both regions actually. I know that it activates speech regions in the left hemisphere in babies when they when they hit. Oh, it was on the slide. I didn't say it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, well, yeah. I mean, isn't that interesting? I mean, it, there are reason, There may be re reasons for that. Um, so. Broca's area is near motor regions. Um, is it possible that they are 
you know, moving towards some sort of imitation, even at that age, that they are rehearsing at least prepare, preparing some preparation for imitation. Well, I'm not saying it's a conscious, it wouldn't be a conscious imitation, would it? But I don't know is the answer. I mean, people don't know, I, you know. But it, it's fascinating that it's Broca's area that's activated. Yeah. So that's more evidence to suggest that there is a preparedness to, to learn, which kind of makes sense because I, I, I can't think that we have a conscious, well, we do, I suppose, a little bit later on. But when we're learning speech as children, we don't consciously manipulate and move our our mouths to produce the sounds, do we? We do it sort of automatically. So um, the, the desire to emulate the sounds that we hear um, must be quite instinctual in some respects. But I'm, I'm being very, I, have to, I need to be very careful here because this, this argument is, is going on and on, you know, and there are still people who firmly believe it's, it's much more innate than that. And there are other people who believe we are much more domain general and this is something that we acquire and learn. Yeah. Okay, so primary motor cortex, and as I've just said, Broca's area is is close to the relevant part of the primary motor cortex. Oh, I've forgotten my pointer again. I am sorry. Damn, I did actually mean to bring it out. There's never anything to... I said, oh, well, I'll go and get it because we have a five-minute break in a minute. But I think I can point. Um, th this part here, this strip going going down, and you've got one on either side. So the one on the left is actually connected to the right part of your body, and the one on the right is connected to the left part of the body, contralateral. And as you go down, if you take a slice, coronal slice through there, this is what you might see. And interestingly, it's, it's organised um, topologically in the <laughs> sense. <laughs> oh, I don't know what I have. Well, as a, as a hint, <laughs> thank you. Oh, this is brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I can just about get up there. Thank you very much. Um, so, so this is organised topologically. So you can see, for example, the wrist is next to the hand, the ha uh, and and the and the wrist is next to the forearm, and the forearm is next to the elbow, and the elbow is next to the arm, which is next to the shoulder. So it kind of maps on to the way in which your body is organised. And right down here, uh, we find the tongue and the teeth and the face and the lips all down here. Because these are the bits that are important for speech. And that would be around about here, yeah? Right next to Broca's area. So the fact that those two things are together, that's not a coincidence because articulation is about moving the, these different parts of your of your head. <laughs> um, and then there was Carl Wernicke, who came across a lot of patients who had damage in a different area, in a posterior region, which became known as Wernicke's area. And they were actually very fluent. They could make all sorts of different sounds, but they were completely meaningless. So it wasn't like they, they actually could produce anything which, which, which made sense but they were clearly able to pronounce each individual um, phoneme, if you like. And Wernicke's area is near the auditory cortex. And that makes sense as well, because you would need to have a very rapid connection between areas of sound and areas of meaning. So whenever regions are close together in the brain, we suspect it's because you want very efficient transfer of information. You want it to happen very quickly. And it, 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 is it designed like that? Well, well, sort of, but actually, you know, this goes back to the proto-map and proto-cortex argument uh, that if you were receiving different types of stimulus, or if you've got damage to a particular part of the cortex, then you would see things probably rewiring themselves in different ways because you're never going to have a Wernicke area functioning as Wernicke's area unless you have actually been exposed to, to language. So it doesn't really make sense to ask, oh, where's Wernicke's area if you never get language because it, it's just not going to be there. But things have moved on quite considerably since then and we now have at least four major regions that we think are responsible for different 
parts of the speech process. Um, we still have something like Wernicke's area here, but you can see that actually joining onto those areas, we've got regions that have been defined more recently, uh, a meaning area here, um, we've got, on, and that's on the left, that's on the left side, but actually bilaterally, we've got this region here, which is associated with acoustic phonetic mapping, which is important. So that's the, um, the sound that's coming through the air being mapped on to a particular phoneme. Oh, I can hear that sound. That's a th sound. So being able to de decode the sound into the phoneme is a very important part of hearing language, but also an important part of speaking language. And then we've got these regions here, which is more traditionally known as Broca's area, still very much related to articulatory speech, but also where we believe that the articulatory speech codes are kept. And by codes, we mean um, programming patterns, if you like, that if you want to produce a th sound, you have to raise the tip of the tongue to the top and produce a voiceless sound. And then, so in other words, the instructions, if you like, in order to produce a sound. Um, and then we have, in the left side, parieto-temporal auditory motor mappings. So the idea there is that you've got sound and motor movements being, being related together. Yes? When you say that Broca's area is related to the articulatory stage, someone with damage in that area would write? Yeah. Yes, I would think so. I would think so. I'm not. I'm not. I. I. I, have, I can't see why they wouldn't be able to. It would raise some interesting questions if they couldn't. But as we will see, a lot of these regions are very related to reading regions, and it's not as if the brain is carefully separated in this way, and you get multiple interactivity between these different regions. So it's not as if information flows in a serial fashion you know so it, it, it's not like um we, we bring this memory of a, a sound out and then we feed that memory into Broca's region to find the appropriate motor code and then we send that on to motor organization it doesn't it doesn't quite work that neatly in fact they're all working together in parallel so if you which, which produces some redundancy, but it also means if you take one out, it may impact on the others, even though, you know, it doesn't have to, if you like. I had the idea that Broca's area was related to the production of language, but not in an articulatory manner, not the movement in the front. No, that's, the, yeah. But saying word, meaning words, like choosing the correct word to say. That's why I'm, I'm asking those. It, I didn't know it, it from this. Yeah, so it, what, what may happen is that you keep the, the, the instructions for making the movements in there. So although there's not damage to the regions that, encourage, that allow you to move the different parts of your mouth, um, the, the, the instructions for doing it in the right order, for example, are, are not so available if you've got damage to Broca's area. This would not be activated with a person deaf, a deaf person? Uh, that, um, if you're deaf, then you would see a different type of organization. So there would be some areas of the cortex that are probably not getting used for processing auditory signals. So the, the, this, these regions here, you would probably see, and this is probably because I'm not an expert in this area, but you would probably see these regions becoming involved in other um, other parts of, of language processing in terms of um, yeah in terms of sign language but there's also the issue of whether they're using sign language or not so that interferes with the sorts of processes that emerge right you need a five minute break now according to space learning but it is only five minutes so warning Hello. 
Hello. I'm so sorry to do this to you. Can I ask you a quick question about the poster? I know I was just in your... I've just been doing a bit of thinking after your um, session. Or do you want to just have it to me? Uh, the poster. Did you come to the workshop so yes, you can? Yes. Yeah, well, then I'll talk to you. Okay. <laughs> no, I would talk to anybody, but but I like you because you come to the workshop. Okay. 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 Oh, well done. Yeah. yeah. Well. Oh, well done. Oh, I've got to ask you a question. <laughs> yes, go on then. Um, can I look at maybe active and passive listening and the difference in the cognitive functions? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, well, the, the question, the uh, my answer to that question is always going to be: Is there sufficient fMRI studies? Yeah, it there might be, actually. Yeah, I find it's yeah. Kind of stuff, but it, it's a bit kind of what you mean. Sometimes it talks about music, sometimes it talks about brain noise. Yeah. And I was just wondering. Sorry, I'll turn this off actually because I'm talking to everyone. <laughs> um, it depends whether you mean. Uh, it's just a, 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 so active, so passive listening is when you're just listening to information. Active listening is when you're processing the information. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking of it from a, a music organisation, even though it's a music teacher. Uh, so, but how can it, so they're processing it mentally? Yeah. So kind of almost listening to music musically. Yeah. So, you might, so there's a different effect on memory. I'm yeah. not sure about music. I'm not sure you'd find music. No. But, so I was wondering if I could broaden that out and just actually think about it. You know, obviously, I'm actively listening to you for this background music. I think I, stuff. My, my honest, my honest sense is, I think you'd be doing novel work. Um, okay, okay. Which, nice which is which is very nice, but you'll find it quite challenging. Yeah. Okay. Because I'm just looking at listening. Maybe. I think it might be worth looking at the effects of processing information on memory, and there should be some okay. neuroimaging studies on that. Okay. Which is very related. Yeah. 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 Brilliant. But you're just going to keep it like general in terms of all information. Yeah. yeah. Register out. Oh, no, I, I found it. I haven't actually put it out. Are people filling it in? Oh, sorry. I, oh, I couldn't find it down there. But well, yours is probably the only name on it, isn't it? Yeah, no, I don't know. I just. I just okay, assume. well, I'll ask. Don't worry. That's very good to tell me. You're there. That's fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> Are you a teacher then? Or, uh, oh, okay. I think it's a good idea. I'm working full time and doing this, but. Are you, are you doing this full time as well? Oh, yeah, I'm working full time. Oh, okay. Hard work. When I nearly went through yeah. red lights, I didn't think. No, be careful. I've got a short question. I was thinking in the research about divergent thinking. Okay. What thinking? Divergent. Yeah, you can do creativity in divergent thinking, yes. yes. It's a complicated area, but there are enough studies. I'm a, I'm a teacher, so it's very difficult. Okay. Well, it, it's it's a challenging area, so be warned. Okay. Right. <clears throat> Is this yours? Yeah. <laughs> Shouldn't do that, sorry. Um, right. We're going to have to get very good at these breaks because we have to have quite a few of them. So, we're going to talk about ordinary reading now, as much as we know about it. And one of the things that I, I have to emphasize is that, in fact, we don't know nearly as much uh, about the normal, healthily developing brain as we do about 
brains that, that are allegedly suffering disorders. And, and part of this is because um, it's much easier ethically uh, and to get ethical consent to put children and adults who have a defined developmental disorder into a scanner, which is a very odd state of affairs. So sometimes I was looking at this one study from Australia about ADHD and they were comparing children with ADHD with their with controls and the controls had dyslexia. I think <laughs> that's really odd group to choose. But they did that because they could they had difficulty getting ethical permission to compare the the ADHD children with children without ADHD. So we, are, we have got a lack of studies about normal brain development. And in fact, um, it wasn't until 2003 that we had any sort of decent study about how normally developing children learn to read, which seems kind of weird, but Turkeltaub was the first one. But we'll look at that in more detail in a minute. But let me um, briefly touch upon the what I would call the old model of reading. Um, I don't know if you've come across this in some of the other units. Have you? Interesting, interesting. And how is, is it, is it sort of presented as the current model? Don't know, interesting. I don't want to get into trouble. But anyway, so, so this one is um, the classic um, idea that you've got a, a horse race really in terms of how you might process something when you're reading it. Uh, you, you, you might, for example, um, you might sort of uh, indirectly process it um, so that you can look at grapheme and phoneme correspondence rules um, and phonologically uh, derive what it means. Now that is going to be quite slow. Uh, what it means there is that you're, you're, you're actually decoding it phonologically and saying, um, the, e, eh, b, r, so, and you're actually thinking, how do I, how do I pronounce that, that word? Um, so, you know, this is seen as a, an important way of learning to read. So you, you would expect less skilled readers perhaps to rely on this more. And maybe that's why less skilled readers, or it's one of the reasons why they're a little bit slower, maybe. Um, and then you have this more uh, direct approach whereby you can actually see it visually, what the orthography is of it, and you can directly link that up to a particular meaning. Um, and maybe you can then take out the phonological um, representation of, of that word and, and utter it. And, and this is much more from memory, because you've got your visual memory, you've got your um, phonological lexicon, and you've also got your memories in terms of semantics, in terms of the sentence that the word is occurring in. So you've got some expectation there, and it's all very quick. Whereas this thing here actually means you have to decode it bit by bit. And sometimes this works very well because you just know the word. Um, and there are some words, you know, also that are quite regular. So even if you don't know the word, it looks like a word that you've seen before. Um, and then there are some there are some words that it doesn't work so well for. If you've never seen the word before, for example, that's going to be really important. But then there are some words that don't really uh, work 